Hey, hey, hey. Happy Friday, everyone. I'm Blake Kotchkis with the Association for Vascular Access, and joining with me today is Dr. Jack Ledun. Uh, he's been on Ecamm, or our production platform, before talking about his last webinar with us at the Association in the I Save That webinar series. Um, but this time, he's talking about speaking at conference. So, <laughs> so Dr. Jack Ledun, welcome to the show. Uh, tell our audience about, uh, if they've never heard from you before, what could they expect? A little bit about yourself, your clinical practice, and and about your conference session. Yeah, sure. Hey, Blake, uh, great to be with you. Uh, as I said, you do a great job uh, making people feel at home, you know. Um, so my, my name's uh, Jack Ledun. Uh, I'm a general surgeon by training. I uh, kind of got into vascular access. Um, the Association of Vascular Access was a big part in the trajectory of my career, um, no doubt about it. Um, I got into um, ultrasound um, by just happenstance. I ran into two lady radiologists in the cafeteria at my hospital, and it was 1997, and they told me they were putting in lines using ultrasound. I nearly fell on the floor. You know, a, you know, I said, you lightweight, you know, what do you yeah, mean? Come on. <laughs> you know, you take a needle and you jab it, you know, you stick it under the clavicle, you know. And then a couple of nights later, I was up in the medical ICU struggling to put in a, an IJ line, you know, and a lady, an elderly lady would look like she had normal anatomy. And I remember saying to myself, what were they saying? What were those ladies saying about ultrasound, you know? And I got somebody to bring me up the ultrasound machine the next day. I didn't know how to use it. And um, I saw that the, the jugular vein was separate from the carotid artery, which I was using as my landmark. And I remember going, oh, you know, look at that, you know? So, um, <laughs> you know, so I, you know, I got interested in the ultrasound. Um, and initially I was using it as a toy. You know what I mean? As soon as I had any difficulty, I'd put it down and stick the old way, which I'd done for, you know, decades. And then we'd make a mark on the skin and put the ultrasound probe down and, you know, use it. And then I, you know, I was, I was getting my needle in the vein, um, but I wasn't visualizing it. You know, I was then, you know, as I kept doing it, I was visualizing it, you know, more and more. And um, finally, here's the patient, but was the, you know, the Eureka moment. You know, I had this lady that was, um, post-op day four from a colon resection. And I was the surgeon of the day. I got called to see her and she's bleeding from her rectum, her mouth, her nose, her IV sites, and her Cipro killed her platelets. And whenever they gave her platelets, the Cipro just killed the platelets. So they, they asked me to put in a, a central line in this lady. I'm going, you know, gee guys, she looks like she's bleeding to death quite nicely all by herself. You know, why do I have to get involved with this situation? They said, well, we want to give her these factors and we need central access to do it. And it kind of made sense. So I said, can we do it in the morning? In other words, it was five o'clock at night. And if I ran into trouble, not that anybody could help me, but I would I would have needed somebody to hold my hand, you know, if we got in trouble. So we did it the next day. And um, I wrote up this, this bogus consent. I made up my own consent form and put in the chart, like, if you start bleeding, it's likely we won't be able to stop it. I'm sure the lawyers loved this consent form I wrote up, you know? <laughs> and, um, um, you know, I set her up and I was, in those days, I was going to the head of the bed and, um, you know, I was making a little skin nick, all the things I don't do anymore, you know? And I, infl I gave her some local with um, epinephrine in it to control her local bleeding. And she had a nice plump jugular vein. You know, this bleed, this medical bleeding patient had a nice plump jugular vein. And I put it in, I was using needle guides at the time. And I saw the needle puncture the vein. And that was it for me. I, that was it. I said, if you could do this patient safely, this is the way it's supposed to be done. And it was the eureka moment. And I, I, never, I never went back. And then the other part of the story is, I wanted to do the subclavian because, you know, as a surgeon, I was doing a lot of, you know, the landmark based blind subclavian, you know, and I want to do the subclavian later on. I realized it was the axillary vein, but that wasn't the point of the story, you know? So, um, we, we had a rep 
from, you know, Bard, and they had the ultrasound machine from Dymax. And Dymax was a family business that it grew into the Bard ultrasound machine later, you know. So the rep was having a clinical nurse specialist with him that day. And I didn't even know what that was. I, I, I had no experience with clinical nurse specialists, you know. And she, I think, was a family member from the Dymax company, you know. So um, I, I'm looking someplace under the clavicle for the subclavian vein. And this nurse is going, oh, yeah, there it is. And I'm going, yeah, oh, yeah, yep, yep. I didn't see anything. I didn't see anything. But I'm saying if this nurse, you know, can see it, then I, you know, I'm, you know, I'm in, tr- you know, I'm the doctor here. You know what I mean? I, I, you know, so check this out. So I stick a needle in with the ultrasound, not seeing, and I punctured this lady's lung. And, and I said, how stupid, like, you know, it was, how, how stupid is that, you know? And um, so after that, I got the, um, ultrasound tech to come up to the ICU and would examine residents. And she could see what we thought was the subclavian vein. It's actually the axillary vein. And I said to myself, if she can see it, if I stick with this, I'll be able to see it. And that's one of the things when you, you learn, when you start teaching people, it can be difficult to like, I guess, push down hard enough from the right location to find the axillary vein when you're doing it. But those were the things that, you know, got me into this. So, um, wow. you know, I started doing uh, the ultrasound guided procedures. And then like, um, you know, I became better than I was as a landmarks based in Serta, which was, you know, hard to admit, you know, because we all think how good we are, right? <laughs> and I went to, I, after, so after like, you know, 18 months or two years of this, I went to the chief of surgery in my hospital and told them what I was doing. So it's the kind of hospital, if you wanted to do something, you just did it, you know, it was, you weren't constrained by much. And um, I told him what I was doing and, and he was a vascular surgeon and, and he told me, keep it to yourself. <laughs> like the, and his, his thinking was like, you found this thing, you reap the benefit of it, you know? And as he's telling me this, Blake, I swear the words were going over my shoulder. I'm going, this, what do you mean keep it to myself? That's not how we do things. This, you know, this is medicine. And what I found was the more people I told about it, the more business I got. Yeah. So I appreciate him, you know, looking out, you know, for his troops, but um, he yeah. wasn't right with that. You know, you don't keep it to yourself. Yeah. You know, you let people know about this kind of thing. So I got into it. Um, and I say the next biggest thing that I did was I started to record, I started finding things on the ultrasound that I hadn't been taught. So then I said, so I, I always think that my gift is that I step outside of the situation and see what the situation's telling us. And the situation was telling me that if this finding was new to me, it was gonna be new to a lot of other people so that I should record it. Yeah. And initially I would have two cameras, one recording the insertion, the other recording the screen, but then the ultrasound started having, you know, video output. So you could, right. and that made it a lot, that made it a lot easier. So you could record, um, you know, so I've got some interesting, you know, I've got some interesting video content over the years for sure. And I'd say the thing I'm probably most proud of is the complications videos that, you know, I've been to a lot of conferences and I don't see anybody showing live complications as they occur, but I've got them because I've recorded so much video. So, yeah, I mean, they're not things that you can necessarily predict are going to happen. Nah, you don't but schedule if the them. cameras rolling, you know, then you and see it. That's another thing. And nothing yeah. like, you know, if you have the camera in the room. And for some reason, it's not rolling, and you miss that once in a career shot. You're there, like you're so deflated. You know what I mean? Because you know, you know, you know, it's once in a career. You know, yeah. so no. That's anyway, not... you know, that's kind of my background. Um, so tell 2000... us about your conference talk. Yeah. So my conference talk, um, basically, this year, the title is um, "One Improved Outcomes." improve your process. Um, it's kind of like a lean six Sigma type of methodology. And then I go on and say, 
the relationship between uh, insertion and care and maintenance, you know. So a lot of these hospitals or every hospital wants improved outcomes and their measure is CLABSI and rightfully so. CLABSI is kind of a unique um, or CRIBSI or CLABSI or, you know, unique complications, multifactorial, and there are a lot of different ways to uh, approach it. Um, but I find that the hospitals want improved outcomes. They don't know how to achieve it. You know, so really, you know, the secret is to improve your process. You know, it's really the only way, you know, it's about processes, um, not people. You know, that's, you know, that's the whole background yeah, behind lean and how do you make the indelible process? <laughs> yeah. I mean, eliminate waste, convert waste into value, you know, all those side of things. And like in my hospital, they try to cram lean down our throat and, and, and I resisted it, you know, f f for no good reason. And then I realized as I was learning about it, that's what I was doing. I was doing my own version of lean. Like I was examining the processes and taking, you know, the better ones or the best ones and making them standard, you know? So, you know, one of the things, you know, I learned from the great Rob Dawson was, you know, you know, what's the big rip about standardization? You know, we all use it. And basically standardization can eliminate unnecessary variation. Right. If you get people to do the same thing, and what do you think unnecessary variation does to your results? Nothing good. <laughs> you know. So basically, you know that's that's the heart that's the heart of my presentation. I get into the nuts and bolts of, you know, what a proper insertion is, and you know the So I go into the life cycle you know, the life cycle of the central venous catheter, it's kind of my thing, my framework, and the care and maintenance, like there are five phases to the life cycle, assessment, pre-insertion, the actual insertion of device, care and maintenance and removal. And the care and maintenance is by far the dominant phase. And it depends on how the line is inserted. So like, um, so just switching gears, talking about this, um, my group gets to go to a lot of hospitals and see what's going on. And um, we do our assessment. And we uniformly, we find four things. The number one, the number one thing we find if we go to a hospital is that nobody's in charge of vascular access. Um, if you walk into a hospital and ask who's in charge of infection prevention, they'll send you someplace. Yeah. If you say, who's in charge of surgery, they'll send you to the Department of Surgery. If you ask who's in charge of vascular access at the front desk, you know, you'll get, blah, 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 blah. you know, you, you won't get very far. So not having somebody in charge leads to unsupervised residents doing suboptimal procedures with outdated equipment. And that is not the way forward. I'm so, you know, so that's, that's kind of the relevance of this talk. And this is stuff like to the people that, I, that I'm talking to, like, if you think you know what I'm going to say in Minnesota, you're probably right. And please go visit one of the other fine speakers in the same, you know, talk. So I'm going to do a video based presentation. But going on with, the, with the, our findings, the second thing that we find when we go to the hospitals is they always, in quotes, blame Clabsy on care and maintenance. And the reason for that is the bacteremia is picked up on day five or later. So therefore they conclude, well, it's not insertion related. Now, blaming care and maintenance is blaming the, the nursing staff. They don't say that. They don't, because they don't want to piss off the nurses, but the nurses provide the care and maintenance and they blame, yeah. you know, they start, they all start looking at their clamsy issue by blaming care and maintenance and like, you know, you get, you have to fix insertion first. This is our message. Like if you want to, if you want to deal with clabsy, fix insertion, insertion first. So the third thing that we find is the acute hemodialysis catheters have the worst clabsy rate. Almost every hospital that we go to, and that is certainly insertion related. Right? Just show me, 
show me the picture. Just, you know, stop talking and show me the picture of your cute hemodialysis catheters, right? And That's the fourth, a big hole. <laughs> yeah, yeah, big hole up by the ear, you know, and that, and that goes, <laughs> those curved tips so it doesn't wind up in your auditory canal. Like, right. hey, you know, <laughs> lipstick on a pig as far as I'm concerned, you know? And uh, the fourth thing we find is many hospitals have a single 20 centimeter triple lumen central venous catheter. And as we all know, the patients come in different sizes and so should their catheters. Not everybody needs a triple lumen catheter, but if that's all you got, you're going to get it whether you need it or not. And it's not right. It just shows that um, they're underinvested in vascular, in vascular access. Um, so when you only have one device, basically supply chain becomes in charge of you know, of what you've got and it's wrong. You need the clinician, you know, you need the clinicians. I'm beginning to think we should start hanging clabsy on the supply chain people and, and see what happens <laughs> if we get better equipment, you know? So, uh, you know, yeah. so, you know, that's ba basically, you know, what I'm going to be talking about. Um, so, you know, sometimes I get Criticism, Dr. Ladun shows the best, you know, the same videos over and over. And like, so what I do is I, you know, I try to show my best videos for a, you know, for a situation. It's kind of like, you know, if people, you know, recite the literature, you're going to hear the same paper mentioned, you know what I mean? At this conference, you're going you're gonna to see the same papers mentioned 15 or 20 times because they are the classic papers. Maybe they're the new papers. Like if I show an axillary vein procedure, I'm going to show what I consider to be my best axillary vein video, whether you've seen it or not. Yeah. Maybe you know, not the most I, recent, but the best. Yeah. 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 You know, and I'll, I'll try to look, I'll do my best. And it's certainly, you know, I gave a, a similar talk to like, like this in 2016, and it's certainly been updated, you know, and addressed literature wise and video. Right. But, uh, but some of my videos will be the same. If, you know, if, if, you know, please feel free to go see the other talk, to, you know, if, if you know this one, you know, um, Stay so it's going to be the jokes and the good else. stories. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's what I got, you know, so basically it's going to be the nuts and bolts of how, you know, I'm trying to standardize the way we insert the catheters, the pre-insertion bundle is standardized around the world. And that's a good thing. And it's standardized at the highest level. So you got to put that in there. No sense standing and standardizing at any other level. I'm trying to standardize insertion at the highest level. So that's why I feel that this talk still has relevance because insertion in these institutions is, can be, is pretty awful. Yeah, you know, I think it's funny how you mentioned, like, if you went into the, the front desk and you said, hey, where's the chief of vascular access? And it's so broadly performed by so many different clinicians in a hospital setting that, you know, like you said, someone has to take ownership of that. And I find even when you have a vascular access team, um, they're still not the only ones doing central venous catheters or picks or you know because right. there's tons of people there's ir there's uh, you know like you said physicians residents um you know and mid-levels your nps and pas are doing lines and and then you have right. the bulk of you know peripheral ivs that are, could be placed by anyone in a hospital depending on the setting right and so, i you know when i was working full time my title was director of vascular access i mean i I was director before that. Then I finally got the title when they fired the surgeons, you know, and they wanted to get PAs and nurse practitioners need somebody to do the training. But I was that, you know, officially for five years and unofficially for 10 years before that. What I find in, in many institutions, somebody has the title director of vascular access, but it's their fifth duty. You know what I mean? They do a little general surgery. They do some trauma. They do some critical care. They do some TPN prescribing. And oh, by the way, they're the director of vascular access. Right. You know what I mean? And maybe there's a small stipend, but it doesn't occupy their day. For me, it was what I did primarily. And I did other things if, on the side if I had time for that. I was a true director of vascular access. Love, and I, I think, 
I think that's what certainly these large institutions need. Probably every institution that, you know, needs somebody that's in charge of it. But the larger the institution, the more, you know, concentrated that person should be just in desk or access. I mean, if you want to improve, yeah. it seems like you want their outcomes improved, you know, but they don't magically, you know, improve, you know. So um, last time I was on uh, doing the webinar, you know, I was talking about uh, Michaela Olson, the, um, oh, yeah. the DNP from uh, Johns Hopkins. And like she contacted me, you know, we're we're friends electronically. I haven't met her. I, I'm sure she'll be in <laughs> Minnesota. But She's like, a sweetheart. You know, Michaela got in. <laughs> I'm sure. Oh, yeah. I'm sure. And she got into her SWAT team and talking about some of the things they do. So I was just in Orlando and I met a great person called uh, Dr. Rebecca Bartles. And she's an epidemiologist, infection preventionist with the Providence system. And she was going into, you know, how they looked at clabsies that were increased in the uh, COVID era. And, um, they would send their SWAT team to these institutions that had, you know, poor results. And they would look at amazing amount of things, you know, and I mean, I really love the stuff. They'd look at the supply room, who drew the blood culture? How did they draw the blood culture? Why did they draw the blood culture? Mm -hmm. um, auditing tools, the clip, we're not doing the huddle like we used to, you know? I mean, 50 things. I mean, they looked at all these things before they went. They would go with four people to an institution, you know, and they had great results. And I went up to the microphone and we later had a Zoom conversation. I, I'd like to get into Providence and see what's going on there. And I said to Dr. Bartles, I said, I really appreciate the work you've done here, but not all the 50 things that you've examined have equal weight. You know what I mean? Like some are more important. I said, to me, the most important thing is inserting the catheter properly. Like, I don't really care about your clip or your huddle or what the supply room looks like if you've put the catheter in properly. And then, con and on the other side, you can fix all that other stuff. But if you don't fix insertion, you know, it's not a sustainable thing. And they and she had great results when they went in. You know, they took their results from like you know SIR of over three down to less than one. Wow. And I, I said, but could you imagine if you did that and you didn't fix insertion? I don't see how it's sustainable. So, so our message to everybody out there is fix insertion first. That like, you know, you can start with care and maintenance. You can start with care and maintenance, but if the catheter's not in, you know, sitting in the right spot, right. done properly, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. And then, so then I say what COVID did was the lines were staying in longer because the patients were so sick and it exposed, you know, the poor practice. I mean, simplistic, you know, right. But I think Dr. Bartles agreed with me, you know, on that. And, you know, we're looking into how, you know, we can get insertion at the forefront of their activities. Yeah. So if you come to Minnesota and, you know, I've, that's basically, and I'm going to, I'll I show you. Yeah. Well, Hey, thank you so much for jumping on the call today. Uh, Jack, sure. I really appreciate it. Um, if you guys are checking out conference and who the speakers are, uh, you can do that by visiting our website, www.avainfo.org. Uh, if you haven't registered for our in-person conference, uh, yet, please take yeah. a chance. Look at those speakers. Uh, this is probably one of the biggest, like, real heavy content conferences that I could even imagine. Like, the topics, the speakers, it is going to be phenomenal. And I'm looking forward to hey. seeing you guys all out there. One, one more comment. Yeah, hit me. Um, one more point. The great uh, Dr. Peter Carr from Ireland is on the schedule. He's waffling about not coming. So if, please reach out. Oh, Dr. this is Carr. like an ice bucket challenge. Like you have yeah, to show please, up. <laughs> yeah, please reach out to Dr. Carr and let him know that you want to see him. Dr. Ladun is calling you out. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, hey, guys, thanks for jumping on this uh, Facebook Live with us. Uh, and you can check us anywhere. I'll do the last scene here. So 
Thank you for attending. Uh, you can follow the Association for Vascular Access anywhere out there on social media. So it's Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter. Uh, check out our website. And of course, we do publish these to YouTube. So if you're a big YouTube fan like me, uh, you can check out these videos there as well. So with that, uh, Dr. Jack Ledun, thank you for coming on today and can't wait to see you in person at conference. And with that, guys, we'll see you on the next one. Thank you.